All right, make yourself a coffee. Here's a short video about Stevenson's link motion. It answers the question, did the motion die or did it simply fade away? It's the latter. The easiest way to spot whether or not a locomotive is equipped with Stevenson's link motion is through its absence. But on this example here, if you look closely enough, that piece of metal oscillating happily away is the eponymous link. The name suggests that either George and or Robert Stevenson came up with the motion, but in fact it was a couple of staff members from Robert's company, a Mr. Howe and a Mr. Williams. From memory, one was a draftsperson, the other was a pattern maker. Two very important jobs in 19th century engineering. In later life, they argued over who deserved the credit, which is ironic because neither of their names are attached to the motion. Like most motions, Stevenson's link converts what I like to call roundy-roundy into backwardy-forwardy. The backwardy-forwardy at the valves allows the valve to either lead or trail the piston, depending on whether or not the locomotive is using inside or outside admission, which is a topic that can wait for another day. The link is located inside the frames by tradition as an artifact from simpler, smaller locomotives where placing all of that oscillating force outside the frames would cause the locomotive's tail to wag. The link is called the link because it combines the forward motion and the reverse motion together. And the link can be manipulated to have the locomotive at full admission forward or full admission reverse or all of the notches in between. Stevenson's link motion was a significant improvement over either the gab or the hook system, depending on whether or not you view the Atlantic as being westerly or easterly. And it didn't get a serious competitor until Volchart's motion was perfected in 1848 or so. But Stevenson's link motion retained its popularity in the face of Volchart's, which would ultimately supersede it for a handful of reasons. It was simple. It was effective. It wasn't patent protected, and Volchart's was. Its issues were at least half a century away, and potentially, possibly, there was a language barrier behind which it was hidden. It's not the case of Stevenson's and Volchart's existing side by side in the Anglosphere in relatively equal numbers. Stevenson's was ascendant. If you look at Swingle's evolution, for instance, there are a significant number of Stevenson's link motion locomotives in its pages with a significant weighting of those locomotives to the pre-1905 period. Access on a locomotive of this size is an issue, but it's not an issue on a locomotive of this size. The space between the lead drivers and the lead bogey combined with the small high-pitched boiler means there's plenty of room for maintenance and lubrication. On later road locomotives that space evaporated, the boiler barrels became greater in diameter and therefore time required for maintenance and lubrication became greater and thereby more expensive. The weight of the mechanism wasn't an issue when 19th century locomotives were developing 19th century power. But with heavier locomotives, more powerful locomotives with larger valves and higher exhaust and admission steam pressures, the amount of work carried by the valve motions significantly increased, their weight of components increased, and compared with Volchart's and its lesser number of components, Stevenson's link motion became quite heavy and therefore also more expensive. It also took a greater share of the space required for counterbalancing all of that movement. We don't tend to think of valve mechanisms needing to be counterbalanced because they take movement off of the rotation of the driving wheels rather than imparting force, but they do. Volchart's was lighter, fewer components, easier to counterbalance, therefore cheaper. And eventually, patents expire. With heavier and more powerful locomotives, the finite space between the driving wheels had to take the frames, the journals, the forward and reverse eccentrics on the driver's side, and the forward and reverse eccentrics on the fireman's side. That finite space, allied with the maintenance and cost issues I've already set out, made Volchart's 
a bit obvious by comparison. Placing Stevenson's link motion outside of the frames would have avoided all of that and on this 19th century example we see just that but it's in the context of inside the frames being occupied by the fell mechanism. For normal service locomotives there were two issues in outside location which kept it as somewhat of an oddity. Firstly there's the extra cost that I've already set out. Secondly, there was no demonstrable advantage capable of offsetting that extra cost compared to Volschart's motion. At least that was the experience on the single Stania Black 5 that was equipped with Stevenson's outside the frames. Thus, Walshart's cheaper and at least equal in utility had its time in ascendancy. Ultimately, its challenges were motions like Southern, Young, Baker, etc., which were variations on the Walshart's theme. Stevenson's link motion didn't die, but it did fade away. Post World War II, I've given you the example of the Stania Black 5, a single example. There's also on British Rail this class of shunting locomotives that came into service in the 1940s. Even so, this weekend, somewhere in the preserved steam locomotive world, there will be every chance that a Stevenson's link motion equipped locomotive will be out in live steam. If one of those is near you, you might want to go out and check it out. And if you do, remember, roundy, roundy, backwardy, forwardy. All right, there you go. Thanks for watching. You can buy me a coffee. There's the link. Like, subscribe, enjoy. Cheers. See you next time.